So uh, happy Saturday morning. We've just had a great uh, chat with uh, some very interesting people, but now we're on to Liam Casey. So Liam, tell us first, how did a nice Irish lad like you get to southern China making kit for all the big Western names? Tell us about this. Got on the wrong plane. Um, so I'd spent 10 years in the, in the fashion industry in Ireland, and um, I had been, um, you know, 10 years at it, decided to take a year off, take some time out, because I wanted to do something different. And I ended up in Southern California working for a trading company. And 80% 80 80 of their business was computer hardware. And it was all originating out of China. And I knew that Ireland had a lot of the manufacturing centers for um, a lot of the US tech companies. So I just saw the opportunity there and uh, ended up originally in Dongguan and then Xinjiang. Do you remember your first product? Oh yeah, <laughs> very clear. Uh, a desktop microphone for um, AST computers. Wow, yeah. it's going back a long way. Yeah. So where are you now? Tell us about PCH today. Um, so again, if you look at our, you know, we've our head office is still in Cork in Ireland. Our operations center is in Shenzhen, and our engineering and uh, innovation center is in San Francisco. Um, we work with a lot of the large tech companies where we bring products from concept all the way through to consumers for some of them. Um, and uh, we now work with a lot of the, you know, the hardware startups, the, with this uh, hardware renaissance. We're working with a lot of startups that want to bring products to market. Huge amount of um, what we've learned over the years is um, the whole, you know, the making of a product is, is a challenge, but the distribution and the selling of a product is actually a, a much bigger challenge. Mm. So give us some of the data now of where you are today, staff, turnover, that kind of stuff. I know you're not public, but yep. we'll get some s information out of you anyway. So we've uh, just over 2,600 people worldwide directly employed. Um, offices in various parts of the world, the US, Europe, and Asia. Um, we've um, s revenue last year was just over a, uh, over a billion dollars. Right. So one thing I wanted to talk to you about um, is that you know we've both got Chinese and non-Chinese in the audience here, and there's over the years, been a lot of misunderstanding, um, kind of preconceived ideas of what it's like to, to work in China, either sourcing from or selling into. So I'd like you to tell us, if you could, some of the, you know, the, the misunderstandings or the, the common uh, incorrect stereotypes that you're coming across about doing business in China. Yeah, I think th the most important thing, and I think you just, in, in your, the way you frame your question is really important, that, you know, when, when people come to me and they say, look, we want to, you know, work in China, work with China. Um, I always ask, I say, do you want to sell a product in China or do you want to source a product and produce a product in China? And then they'll say, oh, we want to do everything. And you know, that's a recipe for disaster. For if you're a foreign company going to China, you got to know exactly what you want to do. And if you want to produce a product in China, you, know, you do that in one entity and you produce your product in China and you actually manage the supply chain and you work with there's some fantastic vendors. And you just work with the vendors and make the product. Do not confuse it by trying to sell products in China in the same business unit. Because you need different um, brains running those businesses. Um, selling products in China is very different to sourcing or managing production of products in China. And a huge amount of companies make, make that mistake. Um, and so that's probably one of the, the most important ones. Um, other ones are, you know, be respectful of the culture is really important. Um, a friend from Ireland about 10 years ago um, he called me and he was uh, coming to China to source product. And I said, great. Um, he said, any tips? And I said, just, you know, just go get in there, do it. And he called me from Beijing a couple of weeks later and he said, look, I just arrived. And um, he said, I'm all ready. I got my meetings tomorrow. And I said, okay, and said, you got a translator? Yeah, yeah, I got a, tra got a translator, got a driver. And I brought my solicitor with me as well. <laughs> <laughs> that would have gone down <laughs> really well. <yeah. laughs> said, Hang on a second. I said, you brought a what? <laughs> he said, my solicitor. I said, why would you bring a solicitor to a meeting? I said, if you're going to a meeting in Dublin, would you bring a solicitor to a meeting in Dublin with a vendor? And he said, mm, no. I said, well, why the hell are you doing it in China? Because it's not any different. <laughs> China is all about relationships and people. And it's, the, uh, it's really about the, the ability to build trust and relationships with people is what makes it work. 
I, I can just imagine that meeting with a solicitor sitting down there <laughs> looking like an idiot. Um, but going on to the point of, uh, obviously everyone wants to sell into China now. When you started, it was all about sourcing from China. A lot of people really didn't look at China as being a market to sell into yet. But of course, it's now it's, it's the hot place. It's the world's second largest economy. It's, it's the economy with you know, the, the most consistent growth, although it's slowing recently. A lot of people are confused about selling into China, whether they can do it alone or they need to have a local partner, either as a joint venture or some other, you know, branding corporation. Tell us your thoughts there about moving into China as a market to sell into. What should they look out for? I think there are great platforms there, whether it's Alibaba or uh, Tmall or, you know, JD.com. There are plenty of channels there now to do it. The one thing is you cannot go in and build the infrastructure. Um, but again, if you have a product that's doing well in a brand that's um, that has you know is well well accepted in the Western world, there's a great chance that it's going to do well um, in China as well. Um, and again, you know, the, the one thing you know, there's in the whole selling of a product, we're seeing um, right across the globe. If you look at the companies that are doing well, just take two companies in China, Xiaomi and OnePlus. Um, they s sell products all around the world with zero inventory. Um, and, it, that, and then you have to use the same rules for, for China. Um, and I think you know, we operate on the basis that we're three hours from all the factories we work with. We're three days from 90% of the consumers on the planet that buy the products. So you don't need inventory uh, anywhere in the world. And I think that's a, that's a rule, whether you're selling in China or selling anywhere in the world, it's important. You know, Facebook used this term, um, a smaller, more connected planet. I think when the planet is so small and, and more connected, it's it's you know how you manage uh, global supply chains and uh, inventory is really important. And we we always say to people, if you can send a package to the International Space Station in six hours, yeah. why do you need warehouses around the world to hold inventory? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> but um, I was going to say the flip side to that though is that the barriers to entry are so much lower, right? You don't need all that stuff, which means. You don't need the capital. You don't necessarily need the large staffing and so forth. So it's so competitive now. Do you think that outsiders, you know, foreigners have the chance when you've got Xiaomi and you've got uh, you know, the Alibaba ecosystem set up? It's very, very well dominated by the locals because they get the market. Is there an opportunity for outsiders? Oh, I think there's an opportunity for brands if you have. But again, I think that it's interesting when you do look at um, the, you know, some of the Chinese companies like OnePlus and like Xiaomi, they don't. Call, they, they call their um, their customers. They call them fans mm. um, and part of a community. They're very focused on the community. If you look at Western companies, Western brands, they look at like the big retailers as their customers. And I think that that's one of the things that the Chinese companies have really figured out. They know who their customer mm. is, and they're able to communicate directly with their customer. Um, and I think that's a huge advantage. And I think that's one of the, the, the phenomena of China. That's that I think the Western world will have to adapt right. to the future. I mean, what's the, that's one of the key points. Western brands have been so used to keeping the distributors and the retailers happy, and then, of course, spending money on advertising and marketing to get the consumer to want to walk in the door. But a lot of energy is spent on keeping those middlemen happy and excited and, and on, on board. But, of course, in China, that's really not, not the end goal anymore, is it? No, no, no. I mean, the Chinese companies, I mean... If you talk to any of those companies that sell direct in China, I mean, they don't even think about distributors. They think about, like, the consumer, the end consumer. And, you know, imp they want to communicate directly with that, uh, with the community, with the consumers or the fans. I think Xiaomi now updates their software. They update it every Friday. Um, and I think they have, like, 12 million beta mm. testers or something, 10 million 12 beta testers that test the software every Friday. That's... A game changer. It's a nice business model too. It's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> you get your consumers to do your testing for you. Now, the other thing I want to talk about, I mean, we've only got uh, a short amount of time. Um, the other misunderstanding I guess a lot of people have about China is, uh, is, is the labor force. Uh, and of course, you've been there so long, you've seen the change in the labor force. Um, what do you think of the misunderstandings in the labor force, uh, you know, people's views of, of the Chinese labor force? And of course, yeah. how has it changed? How has it yeah, changed in 20 it's changed. years? I mean, it's amazing. Like, I mean, you know, when I started in, in China 20 years ago, I mean, you know, I, it was, I, I found it really challenging to understand what was really going on in the factories. But every factory I worked with, I was on the ground and wanted to see the factories. And, you know, we started a lot. We actually focused a lot on Taiwanese-owned factories at the start because you always had a Taiwanese owner was on site all the time, even at the weekends, whereas a lot of the local 
if, we're, if they were Hong Kong uh, owners, they usually come to Hong Kong at the weekend, whereas the Taiwanese guys stayed at the factories. And for me, it was like there had to be somebody there that had a sense of care mm. in the factory, which was really important. And you know, as I walk through the factories, and even when I walk through a factory today, the difference today is the confidence of the people working on the production lines. It has gone way up. It has, you know, there, I mean, it, it's changed. We have, um, we have some very, we have a, a, hot, a hotline for all our workers um, where they call in if they have a problem. We get tens of thousands of, you know, when, for people calling call in, asking questions. Um, every, every month they, they're, they're on the hotline. Um, and it's a, it's a non-profit hotline. Um, and the feedback and the interaction, the requests are just amazing. Um, and so we see, like, now, um, when I talk to factory owners, uh, I was with a factory owner during the week, and, like, you know, he was telling me why the workers are queuing outside the factory for jobs is because, you know, they, get, they pay well, they pay on time, the food is good, the work is good, um, and the workers like the culture there. There's the facility is fully air-conditioned, um, and it's, like, it's something that, that this is what the workers look for. And it's amazing when they post that they have jobs, the workers come there, and they, they know they're right. going to come for a certain period of time, a busy time, but make money, and they're gone. It's interesting. Xinjiang, I think, is very different. Uh, when I, when I, you know, I've spoken at the university a couple of times in Xinjiang, and, and the first question I'd always ask is, uh, hands up, is, who's from Xinjiang? And everybody puts their hand up, and then I say, okay, hands up, who was born in Xinjiang? And okay. nobody puts their hand up. And I say, okay, we're all the same. Most and it's interesting. Most people in Xinjiang are not from Xinjiang. Yeah. yeah. And everybody is coming there, like, chasing a dream, and uh, it doesn't matter whether they're working in a, a factory, an office, um, a, a bank, whatever. Um, there are two interesting stories. There's, there's uh, uh, where two very successful companies in Xinjiang at the moment, both are listed on the stock exchange. Um, one is uh, Linz Technology, and the other is, uh, is um, a cable company, and they both are founded by Workers. Women who worked on production lines. And now one is and China's richest woman, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the, they worked on the production lines. So when you meet some of the ambitious operators on the production lines, they know who they are and they're chasing it. The other thing is that. It gives workers hope, too. Yeah, I mean, you could absolutely. be that person one day, uh, couldn't you? And 78% of our operators on the production lines, and, and in the latest stats, about 78% of them have smartphones. Right. And they see it as a computer, and the way they commu mm. communicate is amazing. I want to ask you, the hotline that you've got, you know, the worker complaint or feedback hotline, what are, what are the key kind of topics or complaints or issues that they bring up it's with you? It's interesting. I mean, um, about a year ago, we, had, uh, we, we saw a trend where it was social events is what they wanted. Yeah, it yeah, was, That was amazing. the big thing that, that they all wanted. Uh, we've opened libraries and factories for them because they want, they want to advance. Again, Anyone who works in a factory wants to get out of a factory. The way to get out of a factory is by educating them. Mm. And by if you invest in the education there, they will actually, and they commit to it, and they help them get out. It, it's amazing the social events. Is, it's such an easy kind of soft um, approach to, to improving conditions. You know, uh, having spent a lot of time covering Foxconn, of course, they had a lot of controversy and, and drama five years ago. And amongst all the other things they did, they started having social events. And, and you'd be talking to, to workers and say, you know, I met my boyfriend, a my girlfriend at a company party, and suddenly they're happy. Yeah. At the end of the day, they, they're essentially young adults. They're human. They've got emotions. They've got needs. And they just want to be social and have friends. Th and that's the interesting thing about St. Jen as well, is that everybody has come unsupervised. They've come alone, mm. chasing a dream. So I'm chaperoned. Yeah. yeah, and they grow up very fast there. Yeah. And it's, you have to be there to see it. And again, when I went there first in 96, it had a population of around 3 million people mm. or something. Today, it's reportedly 18 million people. So it's, it's definitely the fastest changing city on the planet. Mm. There's no question. And when I see the advance of where it's come from to where it is today, it's, I mean, it's amazing to watch. And, and the next 10 years are going to be very interesting as well. The right? pace there at the moment um, is phenomenal. I think they're building the third CBD, Central Business mm. District there. Mm. So. I want to ask you quickly, because uh, we've only got a few minutes left. You talked a little bit about kind of the, the renaissance in, in kind of prototyping and manufacturing. Tell us a little bit about that. And also, of course, there's so many people who have tried to launch Kickstarter, Indiegogo yep. campaigns, and, and a lot of them have been fraught with drama and, and have maybe never even got the hardware product out. So give us some advice for, for those people who are trying to get there. Yeah, so uh, again, I picked this up and I spent 10 years in the fashion industry where I'd go to a fashion mill, a uh, fabric mill, and I'd buy 60 meters of fabric air, and I'd bring it to a contract manufacturer. And right before 
um, we were about to cut the garment, whether it was a suit or a jacket, we changed our minds. We said, no, no, let's make a jacket out of it, not a suit. And that's the moment of truth, and it's a moment of creativity and innovation. And when, um, when I went into the tech world, I couldn't understand it. There was like these technology roadmaps and product roadmaps mm. that went two and three years out. And it, it completely limited and the, the whole innovation and creativity. There was no excitement about you know, a prototype, or and it was like really Friction limited. Friction really slows down yeah. that creativity, doesn't it? Absolutely. And then so when I saw, like in 2008, we saw people coming with Arduino, Raspberry Pi, uh, Galileo. You saw all these new tools like uh, 3D printing. You had Linux, um, Android. So the fabrics of technology had changed. And now you had these fantastic moments of experience of where people would get a prototype and get really excited about it. Because that's when the innovation mm. really happens. And that's when you empower entrepreneurs or engineers to get excited about a product. That's what's, th it's that renaissance in, har in prototyping that's driving a renaissance in hardware. Um, but that's all focused around the product. And we have the acronym PCB, and it's not printed circuit board. It's product, company, and business. And when you look at a company, a startup, and they want, you know, they have a great idea for a product, and they go out and they put it on Kickstarter, they don't have the, the business model, and they've priced it wrong. Um, and they don't have the company to be able to scale it. And they're all the things that we look for. And that's why we set up uh, Highway 1, to help companies to do that. And then we have PCH Access to really help them scale. And the real challenge is how do you actually help them sell it? And that's why we acquired mm. Fab. Um, because that's where you, you bring a product all the way through that uh, channel. And again, a huge amount of the mm. risk for a startup is in the selling, not necessarily yeah. in the making. Right. On the point of making, um, you know, a lot of people are sitting there in, in their you know, apartments in, in San Francisco or New York or London and thinking, oh, I've got this great idea for a product, a hardware product. They produce, you know, you've all seen them, these beautiful videos that sound fantastic and you're ready to pull out your credit card. But of course, it gets delayed. You know, the timeline is 12 months out. It ends up being 18, 24 months. And a lot of it comes down to they just didn't quite understand the process of manufacturing, how tough it was going to be. What advice can you give people who are trying to get that going from the start? Again, when you look at the, the Chinese companies like the OnePlus and Xiaomi, and you look at some of the other bigger companies that are really successful in this space of selling a product, again, we have another acronym, which is PI, and it's the moment of interest. If you look at Kickstarter, the moment of in in interest in Kickstarter is phenomenal. When somebody goes out and launch a product, the moment of purchase is great as well because you click on the buy button, but the moment of experience is a disaster because it could be a year, it could be two years before you get a product. You've got to manage all of those three together. The moment of interest, the moment of purchase, and the moment of experience. And some companies um, have done it very well. We did it with Neil Young with his Pono player, where the moment of interest, put it up mm. on, on, on Kickstarter, it was, um, I think it's $7 million, purchased immediately, and the moment of experience, we delivered it within two months. But we used the, the Kickstarter as a tool to communicate and to generate the, the interest. Because interest, exactly. that's what it is, it it's generates interest. Platform. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's where, if you look at the, you look at the companies that, that manage that well, you know, they get at the sequence really well. And, and again, it takes planning. And it, like, a lot of people, do, they focus on the product and just put the product up on Kickstarter, and it's great. But then they have to think about the business. The process, <laughs> right. Liam Casey, uh, we've come to the end of our time here, so please uh, join me in thanking Liam Casey for his time. Thank you. Great, thanks, mate. Thank you.